House of Mystery presents Inside Writing, the radio show where authors discuss their writing process in all genres. Welcome back into the House of Mystery. I'm Al Warren. Mr. Joe Goldberg, how are you doing? I'm doing fine, Al. New year, new adventures. Let's let okay. it rip. Yeah. Did you did you stay up for New Year's? Watch the no. balls drop? I, I was, we looked at each other and went, boy, are we old. We were at somebody's house, and we all looked at each other and said, game over. We all just took off. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's, there's that one year that comes in your life where all of a sudden you're going home at 9 o'clock. Yep. It wasn't <laughs> soon after. It's like, oh, here's some champagne. Oh, yeah, okay, fine, great. Yeah. It's, I go, I'm tired. Yeah, yeah. We've reached and, the stage. Yeah, you know, it's just because it, it's not that important. Another year closer to death. Yes. 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 We had a good start. We had a good start of the year for a show with me. Well, there death you go. Death hangs out there. The yeah. end is closer than the beginning, as I said in Network by Patty Chayesky. Yeah. Yeah. And quite a few people uh, showed us that over the the holiday there. <laughs> yeah. Sad. Sad. Yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. It all comes at once. Seems to come in waves, you know. Um, it does. But uh, I think the Lisa Marie Presley was the most surprising. Shocking. Since you saw her the night before, if you, or even in the, in, in, or in the clips from the Golden Globes, there she was. And then oh, which, less than 48 hours later, there she wasn't. She didn't look too good in those clips. Yeah. You yeah. know, they were like holding her up, and she seemed very shaky. and Something. Uh, There's something going on. I didn't, I, I, I kind of thought that was unusual, but... That's how I it goes. I, I, I did win $2 on the Mega Billion Dollar Lottery. Oh. So I got that going for me. So you're going to retire? I'm, it's in my pocket. I'm framing it. <laughs> yeah, well, that's a good thing. Well, well, speaking of $2, no, so we've got, <laughs> we've got an author. He's got quite a few different uh, types of books. He's got his uh, hands in all sorts of different books. Uh, um, fiction novels here it's kind of it's really interesting kind of historical and all sorts of stuff going on so uh all the way from across the pond as they say we've got mr william ryan so thank you for being on the show uh, i'm very pleased to be here william now i've noticed that um you've got william and wc ryan so is that like if you got like split personality going on or what what's, what's that happening here uh i i i, I do um <laughs> I have two publishing, two names I'm published under, but actually I'm, you know, most of my friends call me Bill, so I'm actually, I've got a, a three-way split going on, so, wow. uh, but... Is, is there an advantage to that? Is there, do, do you find, is, have you done that for a reason, like do different people um, go for different names or something, or... I think there's a publishing reason for it, so I moved to publisher and they kind of wanted to uh, send me in a slightly different direction, uh... So my first four novels, three of them were set in the Soviet Union in the 1930s. One was set in uh, World War II uh, in Nazi Germany. And uh, they wanted me to kind of go, and I wanted to go in a slightly different direction with something a little bit more lighthearted and a little bit more fun. So when I wrote House of Ghosts, uh, we agreed that I would do it as W.C. Ryan and it would be kind of a little bit of a break. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it kind of it kind of makes sense a little bit, you know, um, if you think about it. Uh, you, you seem to be um, really into historical sort of fictions, like you're really into uh, things of the past, like you were, like you were saying with with the uh, novels set in the Soviet Union. Now that's from they're set in the 1930s, I believe, isn't it? That's right. Um, well, I think. Uh... The past is always kind of interesting, and it's it's slightly fixed, although when you look at it a little bit more detail, you find out things that you weren't expecting to. Um, whereas I think com contemporary, the contemporary world is, is changing very quickly, and uh, people who wrote novels 20 years ago, now they're, you know, it's before the internet really kicked off, before mobile phones really, uh, cell phones really, took over the world. Um, so, you know, kind of things change very quickly. Uh, I think with historical fiction, you know, people can look back on it and they can say that's an interesting place. It's a little bit like 
travel writing to an extent, except you're taking people not only to a different place, but to a different time. And from my point of view, at least, it's a little bit more manageable than the contemporary world, which is, uh, for me at least, quite confusing and sometimes worrying. Uh, William, I, I'm a, I might run on the uh, historical fiction thing, because I think that might be my next step after I do espionage. When you're writing in the his, history, do you are you looking for parallels or themes to the current the time that people can latch on to? You've done a lot of, you do religion, or you do uh, a power of people, or, or the situation of people, then... Do you, do you want them to attach on and say, hey, I, I, I recognize that in today's world? Or is that just not I, there? I always have a theme, but, uh, but you know, kind of sometimes it's, it's not really quite as visible uh, as you might think at, at first. Um, uh, and sometimes it's completely personal to me, and it's, it's not really, you know, the reader knows it's there because I have this thing going on underneath the surface. They don't necessarily know what it is, but it makes a difference to the novel. But sometimes it's a little bit more on the surface. Uh, so with the Soviet Union, for example, one of the things I was thinking about was, you know, can you, at that stage, you had a, you had a population that was heavily monitored. Uh, you know, kind of everything that people said was, was considered and was, you know, looked at in case it showed signs of of uh, resistance to Soviet power, and one of the things that I had going on in the, in, in my mind was actually, you know, kind of, uh, and and we we see it today in some countries, you know, the level of surveillance that is available to governments um, today uh, is hundreds of times more uh, than existed in the 1930s. So, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of fascinating to me. And, it, and it's interesting what's happened with Russia in the last, you know, kind of 15 years since I started writing those novels, um, in that it's shifted back a lot more towards how it was in the Soviet Union with people being arrested and thrown into prison for, you know, for example, calling the Ukraine war a war, um, or showing any kind of resistance to uh, Putin's government. And you kind of know that they now have tools to, you know, kind of the first thing they do when, when they capture somebody is, is take their phone, because they know that their phone stores all kinds of information about where they've been geographically, you know, kind of who they've been speaking to, what they've been looking at, um, you know, kind of what they've photographed. So it's... And that's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what, you know, kind of countries can do. So that was certainly something that was, was going on in the background. Understood. <laughs> Thank you. What, what, what made you choose Russia it, to go back to? And, and, and there must have been a lot of um, research involved in that as well to kind of try to capture, let's say, Moscow in 1937 and stuff like to – Get a full picture of what was going on around your your characters. Well, I think uh, Russia in the it, you know Moscow in the 1930s is a place that has been documented quite heavily, both at the time and 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 subsequently. Particularly after the end of the Soviet Union, all this this information came out that we ha hadn't seen before from the archives. Um, so I couldn't have written those novels before you know, kind of 1990, when when the archives were beginning to open up, uh, or 1992. Um, but once that, for a period of, of about 20 years, we had access to all of, of the NKVD state security files, we had access to all kinds of other things as well. You, you could, you could. I mean, I, I have about 400 books um, on the Soviet Union on, on various different aspects. And, you know, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, kind of, it sort of sucks you in to an extent. And it's an absolutely incredible, uh, time and place. Uh, so for an ordinary person to, to live in 1930s Moscow, they, they kind of had to have a split personality. They had their public person, persona, which my detective, Captain, Korolev has, which is that he's a loyal 
member of the Communist Party, and, and he does think that the Soviet Union is is heading in the right direction. He can see that it's a world power. He can see that the you know kind of things are improving for people like him. Uh, but there's another side when he looks around and he sees that his friends are being arrested, and he sees that you know kind of one day you know kind of Germany is the enemy, the next day Germany is is your best friend. Um, you know, the, it's there's a certain amount of uh, uh, it's very much like 1984, which Orwell was definitely talking about the Soviet Union. You know, the fact that heavily, heavily propaganda-driven uh, uh, government, where you know one day black is black, the next day black is white, um, and so lots of things for me to to work with as a writer, particularly when you're writing a crime novel, because crime novels are about truth and justice, and the Soviet Union was not really about truth and justice, uh, quite the opposite. So uh, he's a kind of lonely man, uh, you know, kind of treading a, a difficult road, and that's always good fun for a crime novel. You mentioned 400 books on the Soviet Union. Your other books are 1921, 1917, interesting years. When you were doing that research, how do you balance the historical part I hate to use genre term, the historical part and the fiction part. Do you do you say, you know, that didn't happen, but I'm going to fictionalize it anyway, and someone's going to do research and say, no, 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 William, you know, that didn't happen, you bad boy, you bad writer. Does that factor into your, into your research as you're putting these things together? Um, I think you always make, you know, you're always going to be making a mistake. I mean, one thing I learned, uh, you know, kind of, from my first book was never give any details about guns because uh, I live in a country where we don't have very many guns so I'm kind of researching it from you know kind of internet uh, ads but somewhere in the United States there is a man who owns that gun yep. and who will come on Amazon or send you an email and tell you exactly what you've got wrong yep. and uh, that just happens so now I just kind of say it's a gun he shot it um, yes. but, <laughs> Classic. but, yeah, but, uh, but, uh, the other stuff, I mean, I, I do a lot of research. Uh, I try and know as much as I can about the time and place, but, but often the things that I'm looking for, it's not really big history, it's little history. So I want to kind of know what, what food people ate, you know, kind of what they did for entertainment, you know, how they lived their life day to day. Um, you know what what life was like for an ordinary person in the Soviet Union or in the Irish War of Independence or in uh, you know Nazi Germany, um, how they got by on a day to day basis, how they got around, you know, kind of uh, just all those tiny little details. And I, I'm I'm sure I get things wrong because they're difficult to research. But but you know, I think I I don't do too bad a job. Uh, certainly. Um, the Holy Thief, which was the first of the Soviet, Soviet novels, was published in Russia, so I thought that was probably oh, a fairly really good sign. Yeah, that's right. Validation. Yeah. yeah. And they didn't come after you, did they? <laughs> <laughs> no, not so far. It was actually published by a Ukrainian publisher, so does that really count anymore? I not yeah. Not <laughs> go there. Yeah. 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 But it was published in Russian, so. Um, nice. Well, did you, did you get any surprises? Were there things you learned about the Soviet Union at that time that you didn't realize was happening or the way people were? Uh, yeah, lots of stuff. Um, I, I didn't know that jazz was really big in the Soviet Union, um, which it was. And I, I found this book, which was, was about, you know, kind of, it was called Red Hot and Jazz. And it was about jazz musicians in, in the Soviet Union and and one of them happened to play a lot in a hotel where I, uh, where I set some of of the first novel, The Holy Thief, and I thought, well, you know what, um, I'm, I'm going to run with that and and use that as the background for, uh, for a scene, because quite often, you know, kind of when you're writing a novel, you've got, you've got things which are, which need to happen, but it it's not, you know, like a Somebody needs to talk to a witness, or they need to meet somebody. Um, but it, it, you have you have options when it comes to where they do it. So there was a there was a big amusement uh, uh, park in Moscow called Gorky Park, which you probably remember from the the movie and the Martin Cruz Smith novel. 
Yeah. Um, so, you know, kind of that's a backdrop for something. The jazz came in. Uh, I had lots of, of really good first-hand accounts of, of football games. Um, and I knew some stuff about, you know, kind of hooligans in the 1930s. And I thought, well, you know, that's another aspect. Um, I also found out about, you know, kind of Russian criminals and, and, you know, kind of, uh, you know, they call it, they call themselves the thieves. They're a little bit like the mafia, but it's, it's, it's more complicated than that. Um, you know, kind of, uh, and tattoos are very important to them. And, and so your tattoos, uh, if you're certainly in, uh, uh, during that period, if, if your tattoo, your tattoos often, you have finger tattoos and chest tattoos and leg tattoos and knee tattoos and they, they tell your criminal history. Um, and, you know, the first question you were asked when you arrived in a prison was, do you stand by your tattoos? So in other words, have you done all the things that your fingers, uh, say you, you have? And, and if you're making stuff up, then those tattoos are actually forcibly re- removed in a very unpleasant way. Um, Whereas, you know, kind of, uh, Soviet bureaucracy wasn't always as reliable as, you know, kind of what was visible on somebody's fingers. So if somebody says on their finger that they've murdered somebody, then they probably have. So. Uh, when you're doing stuff like this, it's, it's almost an espionage case, this case. Um, I, 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 I wonder, do you, do you, do you find it much different than the Cold War time and the way people act it undercover, so to speak. I, I'm, I'm trying to find the right wor- wording, but um, was this very similar to, to after the war? Uh, I think all of my novels have, have an espionage element. So, I mean, my period so far at least is 1917 to 1945. So I haven't quite gone as far as the Cold War, Cold war period, but, but the kind of the 1930s uh, in Russia... It's internal espionage uh, to a large extent, but there's always, you know, the fear of foreign espionage. So Karlov, whether my detective, whether he likes it or not, is is caught up with state security quite a lot. And the last uh, two novels that I've written, which uh, one was set in the First World War and one was set, uh, the the latest one, The Winter Guest, which is just out in the US, um, is set in the Irish War of Independence. And both of those have... Uh, a protagonist who is a straightforward uh, spy, I guess. Um, uh, one for the British government, uh, the other against the British government. Well, let's let's stay on those two books. Both those books have a spiritual element, ghosts and seances. Uh, how does that fact? How, how? Why? You know? How did you mix these different things together? Historical fiction and, tr- and kind of crime and and ghosts. I think with with a, a house of ghosts, um, you know, kind of, uh, I was talking to my publisher. It's, it's the same editor I've had the way through, but it was a different publisher. Um, so I was t- talking to her about. We were looking at, at trying to take a slightly different direction, and so I thought it might be kind of fun to write about an Irish uh, man who is working for. The British Secret Service during the First World War, and but his loyalties are, you know, after the Easter Rising in 1916, where you know, kind of, there was a, a small revolution in Dublin against British rule. His loyalties are much more uh, complicated than they would have been before that event. Uh, so he's no longer quite so sure where he stands, and there's an element of that in the novel. And then, you know, kind of when we were looking at where we might, we might set it and we kind of wanted to kind of have a, a country house mystery with a little bit of a twist and, and, you know, there was quite a lot about spiritualism going on in the First World War. Uh, and that formed an element of, uh, the, the story for various reasons. You know, kind of we had a, a, a German spiritualist, um, uh, or a Russian spiritualist who, who was in, involved in the story and, and had some possible nefarious background. Uh, and then it just kind of made sense to me that, you know, kind of if you've got somebody who, 
is possibly pretending to be uh, in contact with ghosts, then you actually have somebody who sees ghosts the whole time. They're just a normal part of her life. And as it happened when I was at university, I had a, a very close friend, and, and they had a mirror in their family that uh, uh, the story was that the women of the family could see events before they happened. And I thought that was uh, that might be something which uh, would be fun to to play around with and to play around with that idea that you could, uh, you know, kind of, you have this this house which is on this island which is built on top of a monastery and is just full of ghosts. <laughs> it's just, you know, yeah. we're having a little bit of fun w with it. And we threw in the spies, threw in a little bit of romance, and uh, uh, I, I enjoyed writing it. It was, it was a lot of fun, and I think people have really enjoyed reading it as well. Well, and so have you had your own experiences with the paranormal or supernatural that you kind of um, have, have put into the book? Uh, I've, I've, I've had some very strange experiences. Um, I went to a, uh, that my, the novel, my latest novel, The Winter Guest, is, is set in Ireland in the 1920s. And I went to a, a school in a, in a castle that used to be, uh, belong to, uh, a wealthy family whose daughter was killed in, in the Irish War of Independence in an IRA ambush by accident. Um, and, uh, you know, kind of, her ghost was was meant to appear. There were other ghosts associated with this house, and and a lot of the old big houses that belong to the Anglo-Irish Protestant ascendancy in Ireland have these ghosts attached to them. And I I, I certainly stayed in one where I had a couple of really weird experiences. I was I was in the it's now a writer's retreat, but I was in it one night when. Uh, you know, if somebody was walking backwards and forwards above my room for the whole night, and not, you know, the next morning I asked, who is in that room? There's nobody in that room. And then, Ooh. you know, kind of another time I stayed there, uh, you know, kind of I was, I was in bed and somebody came outside my room, which used to be a doorway and was very upset and was, was, you know, kind of, uh, was reciting this old Irish prayer, waiting for somebody, and yeah, you know, kind of it wasn't anybody in the house, so that was a strange experience as well. Run, um, run, yeah, and loads of people. This particular house um, uh, is in County Monaghan, uh, in a place called Anna McCarrick. Lots of people have had strange experiences there, but it may, you know, kind of could it have a rational explanation? Quite possibly, but you know, if you asked me whether I believe in ghosts, I think I do to an extent. I, I think that there is sometimes when there's a very traumatic event, it leaves behind like a, a recording that plays. Um, uh, but I think since since the arrival of electricity, uh, maybe ghosts aren't aren't quite as prevalent as they were. Um, but they're still lurking in some dark corners. <laughs> That's actually interesting. It's yeah, theory. like a stone tape theory. Isn't that what they call it? The stone tape theory or something? When something murderous or very traumatic happens, it, 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 the emotion of the murder and whatever is absorbed into the, uh, into the area, into the house. That kind of makes sense to me. Do I believe it? Maybe 75%. Uh, but there's 25 percent myself that is very skeptical. Um, but is it fun to write ghost stories, and is it kind of something to play around with? Because uh, both both those novels involve uh, soldiers with post-traumatic stress from the First World War. Um, so again, you know, kind of Siegfried Sassoon describes seeing mounds of corpses as he's walking along Piccadilly, and and he just kind of finds himself stepping over them. He knows they're not there, but they're they're completely visible to him. Uh, Secrets of soon being the famous war poet. Uh, so this is something that he actually recounts. Um, and you know, kind of lots of people who suffer post traumatic stress, you know, kind of in various different war wars have had very similar experiences. So 
with the Winter Guest in particular, the main character has these, these, you know, kind of waking dreams, uh, which, which form part of his life and he just sort of has to maneuver himself around them. With your, you didn't start as a writer, you started another professional, you're a lawyer and uh, I was a lawyer. Oh, yes. Uh, the, the British word or the non American word for lawyer. Um, and you became a writer. So what were your influences? Because I see Agatha Christie mentioned in the in the uh, haunted house or locked rooms or the you know, ten, 10 millennials kind of style. Did, was that one of your influences when you started writing? Did you read a lot of that? Uh, I definitely read. Uh, I mean, I, I think when I the reason I became a writer was because I used to read an awful lot, particularly when I was young. Uh, and... And I certainly, I, I worked my way through all of those Agatha Christie's, so they're kind of part of my, uh, my writing DNA, as are Dorothy L. Sayers, Nyo Marsh, um, yes. uh, all of, of those classic crime writers, all of whom, interestingly, are women. So they were there, and they, they're also, they're tended to write, you know, they were, it was contemporary for them, but they're writing in my period, so, uh, so that's always kind of useful for me. Uh, but other writers like Martin Cruz Smith certainly was an influence when it came to the Soviet Union. Uh, Philip Kerr, his Bernie Gunther novels, yes. uh, are fantastic. Yes. Um, you know, there, Agreed. there are lots of, of very, very good historical novelists around. And, and, you know, when I, when I started writing, um, I think my first attempt at a novel was, was, you know, it was maybe more literary and, and I got about, you know, about forty or fifty thousand words into it, and I just I took a step back and had a look at it and thought, this is not a book that I would pick up in a bookshop. So, you know, kind of I think when you're writing a novel, you really have to be writing it for yourself. You really need to be writing the book that nobody else has written yet, but you want to find in the bookshop, and because you know, kind of you're reading it as you're writing it, and you can you can decide which way the story goes. And that's kind of, uh, I think, the way to approach it. I like historical fiction. I like crime fiction. Um, I happen to have done a chunk of, of research into a 1930s Soviet writer called Isaac Babel. And it just, you know, for a, for a screenplay idea. And for, you know, it just made sense to me to, to kind of, uh, to run with that and to, you know, once I thought about the idea of writing a detective novel in the Soviet Union, it just, as I said before, you know, they're about truth and justice crime novels, you know, about finding the resolution to crimes that are being committed and, and putting the guilty people in, in jail. And, and the Soviet Union didn't always work that way. So, uh, so that was, it was, uh, fertile ground for, yeah, planting a novel. Yeah, it gives people kind of a sense of justice if you if you have novels where people, you know, the bad guy gets gets something happens to them. You know, I I think crime fiction is it's it's all about that. You know, kind of I think we we explore our fears of you know kind of violence in the street or you know kind of in the family or whatever it is. You know. Uh, we explore them, but it's it's done in a in a very controlled way, and we know that at the end, by and large, uh, the detective is is going to find the guilty person, and, and it, everything is going to be put to right. And you know, it, no matter how violent they are and how thrilling, um, it's still it's it's all managed within those three hundred fifty four hundred pages. Uh, and I think that's that's what's nice about a crime novel, but you know, maybe my Soviet novels are a little bit different in that they, there's a, there's not always the resolution that you would expect, but there is some kind of resolution. Right. Do you, do you actually plan out, do you sort of sit there and plot or have kind of a, a theme or a meaning or some sort of thing that you want people to get out of the book besides the entertainment value? Uh, yeah, there's always, there's always stuff going on underneath the surface and, uh, Sometimes there are things that are just on my mind generally, uh, but sometimes there, 
you know, certainly with the winter guest, uh, you know, I was looking at Irish history. We, you know, when I, I grew up in Ireland and we, we tended to learn history from the victor's point of view, I guess, from the, you know, because the Catholic majority in, in Southern Ireland, um, you know, we looked back and we had the heroic, uh, IRA fighting against, you know, kind of the evil British, uh, but the reality of the situation was a little bit more complex. Um, you know, kind of when you actually looked at what happened and what people did, sometimes it wasn't always glorious and sometimes, uh, you know, kind of some of the things that were done were not, you know, kind of, uh, quite, um, as we had been told. And so that was kind of interesting for me, um, as a writer to go back and look at it from a different perspective and maybe, you know, kind of consider how, uh, people who, who had been in Ireland for 400, sometimes longer, you know, they were effectively Irish. Um, but they, they were from a different social class and a different religion. And, uh, they had, they no longer felt welcome in their own country, and I think that that was something that was was very sad uh, and and tragic in a way, and that's something that I wanted to explore in The Winter Guest. Uh, but some of my other novels, The Constant Soldier that's coming out next year, which is about uh, an ordinary soldier who comes back to his home village and, and finds that there's a rest hut for... Uh, for the officers and men from Auschwitz, and that somebody he knew is a prisoner there. Um, and that novel is about ordinary people, uh, and because all of the SS were ordinary people, you know, kind of the commandant of Auschwitz trained to be a confectioner, the one before him trained to be a priest, another one was, uh, was a bookkeeper, uh, another one was a bank teller, another one was uh, a photographer's assistant. They all had very mundane careers. Um, but when Hitler came to power, you know, kind of people, you know, got swept up with it and they made decisions. And, and you know, kind of maybe the decision was to join the SS because it, it, you know, it wasn't the military, but it, it you know, kind of lots of lawyers joined it. It was considered to be maybe good for your career. And then, uh, and then you kind of, you've made a, you've, you've taken a step and it's a wrong step, but it leads to another step and another step and another step. And you go from being an ordinary person to being something quite different and you're involved in this industrial scale, uh, murder and, uh, you're, you know, kind of killing millions of people. And it, it's, but at the end of the day, th- those, those people who were doing that, they, didn't set out to do that when they were, when they left school. Um, and for me, that was, that was something that I really wanted to explore. And I thought it was really relevant when I was writing it. Uh, because, you know, kind of you had, uh, around the world, you had people who, uh, were, you know, kind of threatening to do things to other people. <laughs> um, and, you know, there was a rise of, of autocrats, should we say. And I'd, I, I kind of wanted to remind myself and maybe remind other people that, you know, kind of, you always have a choice and you always have to make your own choice and you always have to take your own personal, uh, responsibility for your actions and, and you have to be moral. Um, you know, there is something called good. There is something called evil. You have to make a moral decision each time you know, kind of, you cheer somebody at a rally or, you know, you're faced with a difficult decision at work, um, or, you know, kind of you meet somebody in a kind of confrontational situation. There's always a right thing to do. Um, sometimes it's not the easiest thing to do, but, you know, kind of, but once you, you know, I, I think for those, those people who were involved in Nazi Germany, there was just, Obviously, there were some very evil people at, at the top, but there was there were a lot of people who 
got swept up with that. And I, I thought that that was something that was worth exploring in a novel. Well, you sort of hit on my next question that was rattling through my brain. Is you're, you're writing, it seems, from the idea of everybody has a story, and you're sort of the storyteller. Is that, am, I, am I misinterpreting some of the, what, you're, what you're seeing as you're writing, what you're feeling as you're writing? Uh, well, I think, you know, I write about ordinary people in extraordinary times and in extraordinary situations, but I think that's... That's all fiction. We want to tell interesting stories. Um, but I think if you look at, you know, the places where I've set my novels, like the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany and the First World War and the Irish War of Independence, they're interesting times. Um, and they're, you know, they're, they're going to force ordinary people into difficult situations. And, and that's all good for writing novels and writing fun novels as well. I mean, novels, they might not be fun as such, but they're, they're certainly going to be interesting for the reader, and they're certainly going to be engaging. And, and when I get reviews in newspapers, the word that comes up again and again, and one which I'm very proud of and I have absolutely no shame about, is that they're gripping. And you know, my I- ideal novel is one that I pick up and I put it down when I've finished it. You know, kind of, it's one that just sucks you into that world, and that's kind of what I try to do with my novels as well. I really want to grip the reader and hold them till the last page. I would imagine each novel that you go through, that you write, um, it, it, it sounds like it's very important, very emotional, so I'd imagine each one would uh, actually change you in some, some aspect. I think that's, that's true. I definitely felt like, you know, kind of, because you have to think about morality a lot, uh, um, I, I do think that, you know, just from a, a moral and, uh, philosophical point of view, if you think about good and evil a lot, it, it does force you into making decisions in your own life. Um, you know, you, you kind of have to walk the walk as well as talk the talk. Um, so I think, uh, uh, that's, that's definitely the case. I'm, I'm always trying to do the right thing, but I think we all do. It's just, uh, sometimes we don't succeed. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes you're led wrong, I guess. Yeah. Wrong beliefs. Um, your characters, how do you come up with them? Like, where do they come from? Are they people and, and, um, people that you've maybe come across in your life or you've seen or experienced in, in, in you know, in a coffee shop or something or, uh, you know, like well, where, do, where do the characters themselves come from? Often they come, they come from, you know, the time and the setting. Uh, so if you're writing uh, a, de- a detective novel set in the 1930s uh, in Russia, you kind of have to come up with a Russian detective. Um, and then, you know, the elements that you, you build into that, you know, kind of you give them a, a career that stretches back to the First World War when he's fighting for the Tsar and then he's fighting for, uh, the Red Army in the, in the Russian Civil War. And then he's kind of joins the police force. And, and so we're, we've got this, this history, a lot of which involves violence and a lot of which involves great hardship. Um, and you know that's that's kind of that helps explain why he is in in many ways loyal to the Soviet Union because he's sweated blood and you know cried tears for uh during its its formation uh so he can see a lot of positive things that are happening um and so you're you're kind of looking for an interesting character and then you, you construct him, uh, accordingly, uh, with the, the winter guest, which is the latest novel set in the Irish Civil War, uh, sorry, Irish War of Independence. Uh, again, I wanted somebody who had that conflicting, uh, loyalty. So I had somebody who had been a British army officer in the First World War and then returned home and, you know, kind of his sympathies had, had always been towards uh, Irish nationalism. Um, and he becomes uh, involved on the intelligence side of uh, the IRA who are fighting against British rule and against 
people he would have served with in the trenches. So, you know, that conflicting loyalty is really useful for a novel. The fact that he still suffers post-traumatic stress from, from, you know, kind of the things that he experienced in the trenches as, as so many people did. Um, that's also useful for the novel. And then he has, you know, kind of, uh, he, I needed him to have some association with the family, uh, of, um, the woman who is murdered in, in the opening chapter in an IRA ambush. Um, and so, you know, kind of, that meant that he ha- had to be of a relatively high social, uh, status, um, and have gone to university with, uh, the girl, uh, the woman who's, who's murdered. So, uh, so all of that, you know, kind of just by the, the needs of the story, it's, it's sort of building the character. And then once you have your central character, then you, you build the other characters off that to an extent. Um, because you, you know, once you have a good idea of, of your central character, then all of the others have to be, uh, there has to be some kind of conflict with the central character. They have to either get in the way uh, or be in opposition. Um, and then once you've got conflict, you've got an interesting story because it's, it's forcing him to make difficult decisions. It's forcing him to go through difficult experiences. So it's kind of, it sounds a little bit mathematical to an extent, but the fact is that once characters get going, they take on a life of theirself, their own. And there is a kind of magic to writing. Uh, you know, I teach writing, so I think about it a lot, but you can't, you know, kind of, there is something magical happens when you're writing. Characters come alive. They start doing their own thing. You have to have, you know, kind of lengthy conversations with them to get them back on track. Um, so they do, they do, uh, you know, kind of come to life on the page. I think, I think it's fair to say. Well, once again, you sort of hit my next question. You just described your characters, how they piece together. So do you start with characters or plot? And either way, um, it sounds like you don't have it all rough sketched out all the way to the end that you, the characters can take over and you change the directions depending upon what, what they say. Am I, am I interpreting your, your, yeah, your I think I, I always know what the ending is because if you don't know what the ending is, you don't know what's important, uh, to get there. Um, but that ending can change as the story goes along. And, uh, you know, I think with, with one of my novels, uh, well, with a, a house of ghosts, you know, kind of somebody said, Oh, I knew from, from the first page, uh, who did it. And it's like, well, congratulations. Cause I didn't know it took about 20 pages from the end. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, it, it doesn't always, uh, uh, it doesn't always pan out the way that you think it's going to do. Maybe you go for a walk, go for a cycle and, and you're kind of thinking about it in the back of your mind and suddenly you think, Oh, Actually, you know, if, if this character does this, then, then, yeah, it involves a little bit of rewriting, but that's a much better story. And you're always looking for the better story. How much of yourself do you think goes into your characters? Like your main characters? Well, I think all of your characters have, they have a little bit of you in them because, because you're thinking about this character and you're, you're trying to imagine what they would do, uh, in this, this sort of situation. So, you know, whenever I'm I'm writing a scene, whenever I'm writing an, an interaction between uh, different characters, and I I want to kind of look at the scene from each of the characters' different perspectives because each of them has something different that they want to happen in the book and in the conversation or the the whatever's happening on the page. Um, so there's there's to an extent they're all. They all have a little bit of you in, in them, but me anyway. Um, but then you're kind of, as I said, the, the kind of magic happens and they, they do, you know, kind of, they do sort of tell you things or, or do things that you weren't entirely expecting. Uh, and, you know, they, they, I wouldn't say that, that the really evil characters have much of me in them, but I oh, guess I've had on. to, yeah. Well, you relate to them the most, William. We know. Well, <laughs> maybe not the mass murderers, um, <laughs> but uh, but you know, kind of they're 
but it's important to kind of try and understand them, and it's important for them to, you know, kind of to think about them and how they got to doing what they're doing and what what their motive is for doing what they're doing. Um, you know, it's it's uh, uh, even the bad guy in a in a book thinks he's the good guy. Uh, it's just he's he's got different rules to everybody else. So when you have these lengthy conversations with these characters, are you, are you not doing that out loud, loud when you're out in the public? <laughs> no, I'm, 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 I'm thinking about them. Uh, but, you know, kind of, they're definitely, they're definitely, they're not entirely within my control. Um, so they, you know, once you, you put an awful lot of thought into a character, then you say, well, I would like them to do this, but actually this guy would do something else. Um, so I have to roll with that and and build the plot around it because otherwise he's a different character and he doesn't make sense. Right, right. How do you experience them then? Is this like a dialogue in your head, or do you see them see them as a movie, or how does this work for you? Well, I started right off writing uh, screenplays, so uh, my books are definitely movies um, for me. So I, it just happens that I'm I, I can be the the DOP, I can do the sound, I can, you know, kind of write the screenplay, I can, I can control the actors. So basically, it's, it's all me. Um, but, and I think that that's a, a great way to, to write a book. So it's, it, I don't, it's not me having conversations with them as such, but it's me, you know, having to put myself in their shoes. Um, uh, so each of these characters, um, I have to step into them to an extent. And think about what they're going to do in this particular scene. It's kind of like having actors and, and giving them direction for a scene. You know, kind of you have to know what they, you know, you've before you write the dialogue, you kind of have to know what they want to achieve and what their their uh, how they're going to behave, how they're going to act. Uh, and that's sounds a little strange, but it's it's kind of yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you're not waking up with, like, muddy shoes by the bed or anything weird, right? Not so far, but if it happens, I'll come back on and tell you all about it. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, so listen, uh, how do, do you do in, uh, social media? Or are you really interactive with your readers or followers? Do you like to have them contact you and stuff? And if so, what, what do you have? What social media? And do you have a website? Uh, how do they um, find you? Uh, they definitely can find me on Twitter, and they can find me on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, I have to admit that that I love hearing from people, so you know, can people can get in touch with me through my uh, my website or on Facebook or or whatever. Um, but I have to admit that I've I've kind of I haven't been as active as I probably should be recently. I've been I'm stuck in the Spanish Civil War at the moment, so uh, you know. Yeah. I'll get, I'll get, I'll get back on eventually. That'll do it. Yeah, but that's that's kind of natural. You gotta have to do that, right? You do have to cut off a lot of the uh, world when you're really involved in a in writing a story, right? Uh, I think so. I mean, it's uh, I spend a lot of time trying to to avoid the internet, uh, you know, because it it can be such a massive distraction, particularly for writers, but for everybody, I think. So I I try I I have something called Freedom Software which uh when I'm writing kind of limits me to the in- internet access for about an hour and a half a day. Um and you know ideally I don't even use that hour and a half so but yeah. it means that I can catch up with with stuff that I need to. Um Yeah, yeah, well, I know. Check my social media and so on. Yeah, yeah, you kind of got to limit yourself. I I find that early in the morning, 5 to 6 in the morning I do all the stuff I need to for that and then I've got to got to put it down otherwise uh yeah it's distraction time goes by and you and you're not and it takes you off the course of what you're doing right so yeah there's also a big problem for historical writers in that you know kind of you can think you can be you've got a character and they're wearing a uniform and you think oh I need I need I need to see what that uniform would have been so you can find everything on the internet uh, but it sometimes it can take you a little bit of time to find the right image. But along the way, you will get distracted, and suddenly you will find yourself looking at 
other things that happened in 1937 in in Madrid, um, and yeah, kind of that's the biggest uh, threat to me as a writer is is kind of disappearing down rabbit holes um, in the internet. Which, uh, oh yeah. Now, so what is your website so people can find you? Uh, it's William dash ryan dot com. Well, we'll have that up on ours as well, so people can find it with one click, and in case they forget. And uh, it's been a real pleasure. So, our guest, William Ryan, thank you for being here. Thank you very much, guys. It's been a pleasure talking to you, and thanks for asking such great questions. Thank you. You've been listening to the House of Mystery Radio Show. To find out more about our guests hosts or shows go to www.houseofmystery.com show's over for now was it as good for you as it was for me yeah good night this has been a production of something weird media i'll be back